With the rising prices over the past year, Social Security beneficiaries could be looking at the largest cost of living adjustment since 2008. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at that, discussing its history, and also what type of adjustments we may be looking at. Hi, my name is Josh. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, I make videos on financially related content and other news, so if you're interested in that type of content, feel free to stick around and possibly even subscribe. Also, if you would like to earn a couple of free stocks valued up to $2,300 for a limited period of time, Webull is giving my viewers two free stocks, which you can receive by clicking my link in the description box below. Okay, so prior to the year of 1975, Social Security benefit increases would be set by different pieces of legislation. That all changed in 1972 when legislation was signed into law by President Nixon saying that beginning in 1975, benefits would instead rise by the same percentage as the cost of living. This was basically intended to ensure that proper adjustments were made to Social Security payments based on, well, the cost of living. Among some of the other provisions in the bill included higher benefits for most people eligible for benefits as aged widows and widowers. There were also changes in the retirement test to ensure that the more a beneficiary works and earns, the more spendable income that he receives. A special minimum benefit was also included for those who worked in covered employment for many years, but at low earnings. Higher benefits for workers who do not get Social Security benefits before age 65, but continue to work past that age, among other things. The way cost of living adjustments were made changed a little bit since enacting this new law, but since 1983, cost of living adjustments were based on increases in the consumer price index for urban wage earners and clerical workers from the third quarter of the prior year to the corresponding quarter of the current year in which the COLA became effective. As you can see, the chart up on the screen shows some really big increases in the 1970s and early 80s due to high inflation during those years, but since settling down and mostly being in the 1-3% to range over the last decade. If you average things out over the past 10 years, the COLA has been around 1.7% with increases anywhere from 0 in 2015 to 3.6% in 2011. Based on data from the Consumer Price Index from the Bureau of Labor Statistics through the month of June, the 2022 COLA could be as high as 6.1%, which, again, if it is, would be the biggest increase since 1982 and very comparable to 2008. Just to put this in dollar terms, a 5% increase would boost the average monthly benefit by about $77. While an average $77 monthly doesn't seem like a lot of money, for a lot of people, it could make a lot of difference. Among some of the rising prices, we've seen a gallon of unleaded gas go from an average of $2.20 up to $3.16. We have also seen the price of airline tickets skyrocket up 24.6% in the past 12 months. And most of all, used car prices have jumped a whopping 45.2% in the past year. Of course, many economists do expect this to eventually cool down as supply and demand evens out. In the meantime though, these higher prices are taking a tremendous toll on retirees, others on Social Security benefits, and, well, pretty much everyone. Now recently, a representative in the House, John Garamendi, introduced a bill that could change a lot of how these Social Security cost of living adjustments are calculated. Instead of how they're currently doing it, as I mentioned prior, instead they would require the consumer price index for the elderly to calculate what should be a fair cost of living adjustment for seniors. Currently, as I mentioned, they're using the consumer price index for urban wage earners and clerical workers, which is based on a fixed market basket of goods and services. Now, this bill being proposed by Representative Garamendi is called the Fair Cola for Seniors Act of 2021, and in a statement, he said, Seniors and disabled citizens rely on Social Security benefits for a large portion of their income, and it's about time for Social Security benefits to reflect their lifestyles. Using COLA that actually reflects how retirees spend their money, especially in healthcare, is a no-brainer that will increase benefits and make Social Security work 
better for the people it serves. Garamendi also noted that from 1982 through 2011, CPIE rose at an average annual rate of 3.1%, which when compared to the CPIW at 2.9% was a good bit higher. Since retirees tend to spend more money on healthcare and housing costs and less on transportation, they're not getting an accurate increase on what they should be receiving. Of course, as noted in the increase of gasoline prices, that would actually reflect more in the CPIW instead of in the CPIE. So again, an interesting bill for sure, but a very small percentage of bills that end up being introduced hardly ever even make it on the floor for a vote, much less get signed into law. Regardless, making changes to Social Security has been a hot topic for decades now, and I'm sure you've all heard different time frames on when the Social Security Trust Fund will run out. Some say within the next 10 to 15 years, and some say even shorter than that. Either way, it's apparent that the current system has been a failed one, and people receiving Social Security aren't getting nearly enough to fund their lifestyles. In the 1990s, President Clinton floated the idea of investing some Social Security assets in stocks, which really wouldn't be too bad of an idea, but of course at the time, he was mostly laughed at and it never gained too much traction. Then in 2004, President George Bush, after being reelected, suggested privatizing Social Security as well. A lot of this ended up backfiring also, and even today, you still see advertisements attacking Republican candidates saying that they want to privatize your Social Security. So right now, these Social Security trust funds are invested in Treasury Secretaries which we all know is one of the safest investments possible. While safe, you're also not getting the greatest of returns. Let's say if instead the money had been invested in the stock market and index funds, they would have received an average annual return of 10%, making the fund a lot more solvent. Of course, you're also facing a lot more risk, and that's a route they never went into. Now, I don't want to get too far off topic, but while it's apparent that Social Security probably isn't going to be enough to live on, that's why funding your own retirement may be a good idea. One of the best ways to do this is by investing into an IRA where there are two main types, a traditional IRA and also a Roth IRA. Traditional individual retirement accounts first became available in 1975, the same year as when Social Security became reformed, and anyone with earned income could make a contribution to their account. The Roth IRA, However, didn't come until 22 years later when in 1997, the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997 was signed into law. The first Roth IRA accounts were then opened in 1998. Basically, the difference between the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA is in the way you're taxed. With the traditional IRA, whatever amount that you invest into your account, you can subtract from your net income and therefore you'll be taxed less. So if you earn $40,000 per year and you invest $5,000 this year into your traditional IRA, you can subtract that amount from your income. That way, instead of being taxed on $40,000, you'll only be taxed on $35,000. However, when you go to withdraw from your traditional IRA, which should be after the age of 59 and a half, you will be taxed on the capital gains that you made. So let's say that you invest $3,000 every single year into your traditional IRA for 30 years, totaling $90,000 of contributions. Off those investments, you gain an average return of 10% per year, so your account balance would have risen up to around $540,000 by that time. Since your $90,000 worth of investments are now worth $540,000, once you withdraw that money, you will be taxed on the $450,000 in capital gains that you made. So with the traditional IRA, you're taxed on the money you made after you realize your gains. The Roth IRA, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. With the Roth IRA, you can't deduct your contributions from your income, but once you go to take out your earnings at the age of 59 and a half, or whenever you decide to, you won't be taxed on that money either. So again, if you invest $3,000 per year from the age of 20 until the age of 60, 40 years in total, and you gain a modest 10% return on your investments, by the time you go to take it out, it'll be worth nearly $1.5 million. In total, you would have made capital gains of around $1.34 million, and none of it, not even a single penny, will be taxable. 
That's why, in my opinion, the Roth IRA is the most powerful of the two vehicles, but in order to avoid getting too long-winded on this topic, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video. If you would like to learn more about IRAs, traditional, and Roth, I will leave a link in the description box below where I go into more detail on that topic. And also, before I go, don't forget to grab your two free stocks from Webull by clicking my link in the description box below. So thank you so much once again for watching, and if you made it all the way to the end, I would greatly appreciate if you could take just a few more seconds out of your day to like this video, share it, and also subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.